well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. So, originally, we were supposed to have Culpeper County, Virginia Sheriff Scott Jenkins on today's program talking about his reaction uh, to Virginia Governor Ralph Northam's latest executive order. I believe we're up to Executive Order 62 now from uh, Governor Ralph Northam, uh, which does allow uh, some parts of the state to reopen, at least start to reopen. We are now in phase one in Virginia, and that includes Farmville, Virginia, where uh, this program originates each and every day. So my uh, friend who has been struggling to keep his restaurant afloat, they are now allowed to actually seat people at the restaurant, albeit outside on the deck at 50% capacity. Indoor ranges are now allowed to reopen in the state of Virginia, albeit with uh, 50% capacity and other social distancing measures in place. But Northern Virginia, that uh, that's still under lockdown. Richmond, that is still under lockdown as well. The uh, uh, local officials in those uh, parts of the state uh, asking the governor to keep them on a lockdown or allow them to uh, remain on lockdown. And the governor has said that is fine. So if you're a Virginia gun owner, you want to get out to the range this weekend, you're unfortunately not going to be able to go to the NRA range in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, Clark Brothers uh, down in the Warrenton area might be your closest range that you can get to. Uh, Colonial Range in uh, uh, Richmond, Virginia, still not open, unfortunately. Uh, So we are slowly... Starting to get back to normal here, but uh, the key word there is slowly. Uh, And we will uh, talk with Sheriff Scott Jenkins on Monday's program about uh, his reaction to Governor Ralph Northam's latest order. Again, we were scheduled to chat with him today, but you know how it is when you're a law enforcement officer. Sometimes things come up. So the uh, sheriff uh, unexpectedly uh, called away, not able to do the interview today, but we'll get to uh, our interview with Sheriff Scott Jenkins on Monday's Bearing Arms. Cam and Company. Also, just a uh, quick preview. We'll be talking on Monday as well about what the Supreme Court uh, is doing or has done, if anything, regarding those 10 cases having to deal with the Second Amendment that they are considering in conference today. We spoke about this with Alan Gottlieb of the Second Amendment Foundation on Thursday's Cam and Company. And uh, yes, all 10 cases up for review in conference today. And the orders from Friday's conference will come out Monday morning around 9 o'clock, maybe 930 Uh, And it should not be long after that before we learn whether or not the Supreme Court is going to take any of these 10 cases now, whether they're going to keep them over for another conference or whether they will dismiss uh, any or all of these cases. As uh, Alan Gottlieb said, he doesn't think it's likely that the court is just going to pass on all of these cases, uh, although they may keep them for, uh, you know, another conference or two. But I think we are getting closer uh, to the Supreme Court taking up one of these cases. We're going to talk more about that on Monday's uh, Bearing Arms Cam and Company as well. What I wanted to do today, though, is talk a little bit about what's going on uh, with our neighbor to the north up in Canada. You know, Justin Trudeau announcing this sweeping gun ban that uh, has not only uh, banned, you know, common semi-automatic firearms like uh, the AR-15, AK-47 platforms, but uh, has even wrapped up uh, common hunting shotguns in this ban because the ban was so ill-conceived. They're banning things based on muzzle velocity. They're banning things by name. They're banning things based on the uh, diameter of the barrel. Yeah, I know. It's crazy. And uh, and there are folks in Canada right now that are struggling to figure out what to do about this. The uh, National Post had a story about a Vancouver uh, gun club that is telling their members, uh, listen, you can't bring uh, restricted or prohibited items. Prohibited. There are various categories. Restricted is a category. Prohibited is the other category. What uh, the Justin Trudeau has now, uh, you know, tossed thousands of models of uh, firearms into. And this gun club is basically telling its members, don't bring prohibited items to the range. But they're also saying, we're not telling people what those prohibited items are because we don't know because of how confusing uh, this new law really truly is. Uh, The National Observer's Carrie Meyer spoke with Douglas Bancroft, who's the president of the Victoria Fish and Game Protective Association, and he said, we have to let a judge decide, don't we? 
Uh, he said, you know, the, the 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 staff of this range, he said, quote, they're not there to look at your farm or to try to figure out whether or not you're allowed to have it there. He said, we need to tell our members not to bring a prohibited device, but I'm not going to tell them what a prohibited device is because I can't make sense of some of the rules. As the National Observer reports, one clause in Trudeau's gun ban uh, bans any firearm with the gun's barrel or the gun barrel's inner diameter greater than 20 millimeters. Another bans any firearm, quote, capable of of discharging a projectile over a specified level of uh, muzzle energy. Uh, the two clauses, the paper writes, have limited exceptions, such as for bomb disposal, but their general uh, applicability has sparked confusion over what type of firearms are now prohibited, uh, including a great big old cannon in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia, called the 9 o'clock gun, which is a uh, antique naval cannon. It is fired uh, to uh, tell the time there in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. The uh, Canadian Sporting Arms and Ammunition Association published a legal opinion back on May the 4th saying that uh, 12 gauge shotguns uh, included in this diameter ban. They say there's between 1.5 and 2 million of these firearms in circulation in Canada. Uh, Bill Blair is the federal public safety minister, said uh, on May the 5th that 10 and 12 gauge shotguns should not be subject to the prohibition because they would be under the diameter ban. But he's. Uh, you know, he's saying this, but it's actually not up to Bill Blair. It's up to the RCMP uh, to determine what firearms are banned, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. And uh, Justin Trudeau is taking this out of the hands of lawmakers, which is one of the reasons why a petition calling for a uh, rescinding of this ban has gathered more than 100,000 signatures uh, since the ban was announced. People are not... Uh, simply rolling over and complying with this gun ban in Canada. But here's the bad news. This is only part of Justin Trudeau's uh, anti-gun plans. The other part of this plan is to allow cities across the uh, country of Canada to ban handguns. And gun control advocates in Canada are actually complaining that that doesn't go far enough. Take a look at this piece from the uh, Canadian Broadcast Corporation. It's an opinion piece. Uh, by a, a gentleman named uh, Tony Keene, why Canada should ban the sale and ownership of handguns. Not, not you know, Montreal or Toronto uh, or uh, uh, Vancouver, but why the entire country, he says, should ban all handguns. And why is that? Well, he says there's just no reason for anybody to uh, to actually want to own one. Quote, there's no conceivable reason why an ordinary person needs to own a handgun. No reason whatsoever. You know, I, I, again, um, Canada is a different animal than the United States. They don't have a right to keep and bear arms uh, in uh, the Canadian Constitution. They, they, the the uh, uh, Canadian Constitution from, I think it was 1876, does talk about the right to life and liberty and the protection of property, but it doesn't specifically mention the right to keep and bear arms. So gun ownership is widely seen by the courts as a privilege. The Canadian state, uh, Supreme Court has ruled that you don't have a right to own a gun if you are a Canadian citizen. So the argument that we would typically use when an American uh, gun control advocate says, well, there's no reason for you to need a gun. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't need a reason to need one. I have a right to own one. That doesn't fly up in Canada. And the restrictions on handguns in Canada already uh, are, are rather restrictive. Um, it is possible to use a handgun in self-defense in Canada, but uh, rarely does it happen. I think rather, though, than uh, uh, Keene's uh, argument that there's no need to own a handgun, I think we need to go in the opposite direction. I, I think there should be a right to keep and bear arms in Canada, including for self-defense. Keene says that um, those of us trained in the use of handguns, and he says that I mean properly trained by the police or the military, not just a weekend course at the local gun club, uh, know that the armed amateur is dangerous. Yeah. He says a police officer on a gun call doesn't want Citizen Rambo whipping out a personal gat to come to their assistance. Uh, that officer needs a clear field of observation and fire and only one potential threat. Well, again, you know, here in the United States, we have um, every day armed citizen stories where people are able to protect and defend themselves because the police aren't there. Uh, it is easier to carry a gun than it is to uh, throw an officer, uh, uh, you know, over your back and walk around with a uh, cop uh, at all times.
So, you know, again, Keene's approaching this from the Canadian perspective, but uh, here in the United States, um, no, armed citizens actually save lives each and every day. And uh, by the way, the police, generally speaking, uh, in the United States, don't have issues uh, with armed citizens because, again, they know that uh, they would much rather roll up uh, on a scene of a self-defense shooting than on a homicide where an unarmed homeowner was killed by a home invader. Uh, of those two options, they would much prefer the armed citizen who was able to protect and defend themselves. We also really haven't had any issues, even when police have responded to um, uh, you know, active shooters, uh, in terms of the uh, law enforcement officers being able to tell who the good guy is and who the bad guy is, there was a situation in uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, about six weeks or so ago, a uh, shooting in a uh, parking lot where a uh, uh, individual rolled up, started trying to shoot at uh, folks that were standing in the parking lot. Armed citizen uh, was there, able to stop that attack right away. Police had no problem figuring out who the bad guy was and who the good guy was uh, in that situation. Now, I don't know what uh, uh, Justin Trudeau was ultimately going to do here. I suspect that uh, Trudeau is going to stick with the regional model, allowing cities to pass these gun bans on their own. This is not, generally speaking, playing that well in Canada. Even gun control advocates are mad at Trudeau because they say his gun ban hasn't gone far enough. Gun owners obviously ticked off at Justin Trudeau for saying that uh, his ban goes too far. I, I think politically, Trudeau just kind of wants to wash his hands of this. He just wants to get this done and over with and move on. Uh, and he's probably not going to uh, go as far as gun control advocates want in passing a, a nationwide handgun ban. Now, one thing that uh, Keene doesn't even mention in terms of his uh, support for a nationwide ban on the ownership of handguns is how on earth that would be enforced. He says that there should be strict penalties uh, and prosecution for those who violate the law. He says that uh, there should be a, quote, total and absolute ban on handgun sales and on handgun ownership by private citizens uh, with long prison terms, he says, for violations. Huh. So long prison terms for simply possessing a handgun. Keene says uh, there should be also a restriction of long guns to bolt action rifles and limited magazine shotguns. No, so not even lever action rifles would suffice for uh, Mr. Keene. I mean, uh, you know, firearms that have been around for uh, 150 years are too modern for uh, Mr. Keene in terms of what he wants to see there in Canada. He says there should also be firm enforcement of minimum sentences for possession of any restricted weapon and even more stringent penalties for anyone committing a crime with a firearm. How about we just have the increased penalties for people committing a crime with a firearm and then we don't try to lock up Canadians by the tens of thousands for simply maintaining possession of the guns that they currently own. Uh, he also says, by the way, that there should be exemptions under strict controls. Uh, where uh, subsistence hunting is a way of life. I have a feeling if they were to try to enact this sort of ban, subsistence hunting would become a much bigger way of life for a lot of Canadians, don't you think? Uh, but again, nowhere in his grandiose proposal does he actually talk about how this law would be enforced. Yeah, he wants to put people in prison, but he doesn't talk about how on earth this law would actually be enforced, which is a, um, it's a pretty big problem. Especially when you consider that uh, in a number of Canadian provinces, again, there is considerable pushback to uh, the gun ban that's already been announced by Justin Trudeau, much less the uh, pushback that would come if handguns were banned outright in the country. Now, as for the uh, possibility of a Canadian-style uh, gun ban here in the United States, I mean, look, anything's possible with Joe Biden, right? Uh, he has not called for a ban on handguns, but Biden has called for a national gun licensing scheme, a national gun uh, registration scheme. And he too is promising uh, federal penalties, a federal felony charge. If he gets elected, if he puts his gun control agenda in place and you are found to be in possession of an unregistered firearm or you don't have your federal gun license, your federal permission slip to exercise your constitutionally protected rights. Here, too, Biden's not talking much about enforcement. Biden is talking a lot about the laws that he wants to put on the books, but he's not talking at all about how those laws would actually be enforced. And that, again, is a huge problem for gun control advocates. 
Look at what's happening in the country right now. We've got governors that are repealing orders to wear masks because there's no way that they can force compliance without putting a lot of people behind bars. Governor Mike DeWine in Ohio uh, was one of the first in the country to come out with a mandatory mask order. He was also one of the first in the country to rescind a mandatory mask order. And he was asked about this and he said, you know, it just it went too far. And he said, and the, the, the more you tell people to do something, the less they want to do it. There's going to be more noncompliance. And frankly, it's just it becomes a bigger issue for us. Now, if you can't force Americans to wear masks, you're not going to be able to force Americans to hand over their firearms. It's just not going to happen. And I'm not talking about the boogaloo or some sort of a violent uprising. I'm talking about simple civil disobedience, a simple but firm no on the part of tens of millions of Americans. And what is the government going to do when tens of millions of Americans say no? Are they going to put them all in prison? Of course not. Are they going to try to fine all 10 million or 20 million Americans and say no to getting a federal gun license? Eh, they might try. Good luck with that. And whether or not Biden uh, acknowledges or not, uh, the primary enforcement is going to be in deep blue Democrat-run cities Largely against minority gun owners, you know, the uh, the, the same folks that uh, Michael Bloomberg has targeted uh, and targeted during his time as mayor. I mean, that is what we have seen in, in city after city and state after state, a disproportionate impact uh, 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 when it comes to these gun laws, enforcement of these gun laws. Uh, it is primarily falling on uh, young black men. You know, you can go and you can look at and I've talked about this on the program several times, a uh, podcast. Uh, by Slate's Emily Bazelon, and this was last year. Uh, she also wrote a book about this. She spent about two months in the Brooklyn gun court in New York, just looking to see, all right, who's being charged with legal possession of a fire? Are these career criminals? Are these, uh, you know, really violent offenders? And she found out, no, not most of them. She said about 70% young black men without any serious criminal history, and the only crime that they were charged with was illegal possession of a firearm, which under uh, New York law is a pen, uh, f uh, felony that is punishable by up to three and a half years in prison. These are the types of policies that uh, Mr. Keene up in Canada wants to put in place. These are the types of policies that uh, Joe Biden wants to put in place here in the United States. And again, they're thinking a lot about putting laws on the books, but they're not thinking much at all about uh, how those laws would actually be enforced. I mean, we have, I don't know how many hundreds of Second Amendment sanctuary counties and cities uh, across the nation right now that have already said, look, we're not enforcing any unconstitutional uh, uh, gun control edicts. I guarantee you that if uh, Joe Biden gets elected, if his gun control agenda becomes law, you will see not every one of these Second Amendment sanctuaries. Some will acquiesce, but but I, I guarantee you, you will see hundreds say, listen, I'm, I'm not going to enforce uh, any of these new federal gun control laws. They will not be enforced by uh, our officers in my department. Uh, we'll leave it up to the states. Just as, I mean, frankly, just as we saw uh, the last time the country got ban happy uh, back in the 1920s with prohibition. And you had a number of localities around the uh, United States say, okay, well, this is a federal prohibition on alcohol, so let the feds enforce it, because we're not going to enforce it ourselves. That same scenario will play out if Biden uh, tries to implement uh, any sort of gun control measures if he is elected in November. Uh, however, I, I don't want to paint too rosy a picture here. I mean, there'll be court challenges. There'll be, uh, again, civil disobedience. You'll have Second Amendment sanctuaries that'll pop up. But in some parts of the country, those unconstitutional orders would absolutely be enforced, which is, I think, why it's uh, critically important that we all get involved as gun owners and we make sure that, um, A, Joe Biden does not get elected in November, and B, uh, that we have pro-Second Amendment lawmakers in both chambers of Congress that could block uh, any of Biden's bad ideas when it comes to your right to keep and bear arms. All right, let's get to today's uh, armed citizen story, our good deed of the day, and our recidivist report. We will start there from the uh, Lone Star State of Texas, where a uh, man who has been charged uh, with uh, homicide in Lubbock's most recent murder turns out well-known to law enforcement, in fact, uh, charged with murder just a, a few years ago. Uh, according to 
Uh, Fox 10. No, excuse me. I'm sorry. According to uh, everything Lubbock dot com, uh, 22-year-old Christopher Carmona, not only arrested for murder, but arrested for being a felon in possession of a firearm. Police arrested Carmona on Monday for the murder of 23-year-old Walter Harper. Warren said that Carmona came to see a woman in her apartment, was angry that Harper was already there with her. Uh, an arrest warrant said after the shooting that Carmona was quoted by the woman as saying, it's all good, he's gone. Yeah. Uh, EverythingLubbock.com looked up the previous felony charge that was on uh, Carmona's record. And uh, court, rep- uh, court records said that Carmona took a deal for attempted burglary. But the details of the case actually revealed that uh, that was a sweetheart deal. December of 2012. Police arrested three teenagers for shooting and killing 34-year-old Mark Morris. Uh, Nathan Sproles, Zachary Price were both 17 at the time of their arrest. Carmona was arrested. Police didn't name him at the time because he was just 15. The murder case against Carmona was dropped. He was charged instead with attempted burglary of a habitation. In May of 2014, Carmona ended up taking a plea deal. He received 10 years probation. Again, after originally being charged with murder. In 2015, Everything Lubbock reports that Carmona's probation was revoked. He was ordered to serve six years in prison, minus credit for time served. Uh, Prosecutors filled out a form saying the parole was, quote, not recommended. So that's 2015, ordered to serve six years in prison. That'd be 2021. That would mean that Mr. Carmona should still be behind bars. Instead, he was not. He was released in 2019. and has been out on the streets ever since. By the way, none of those three teenagers actually ended up facing murder charges. Everything Lubbock reports that uh, the murder charge against Sproles was dropped in exchange for a plea deal on theft. He was sentenced to five years of probation. Price took a deal for attempted robbery and accepted 10 years of probation, which was later revoked uh, for a 10-year prison sentence, but he was released in 2019 as well. I mean, so again, three individuals charged with murder. None of them actually, none of them actually, ended up facing any charges relating to the death of Mark Morris at all. All right, on to our uh, armed citizen story of the day: Texas County, Missouri, where investigators say a, a shooting is, was a clearly self-defense. They have uh, been investigating this, but they feel comfortable making that determination right now. Sixty-three-year-old Michael Eskridge of uh, Mountain View, Missouri, died in the shooting. Deputies responded uh, to Summersville, Missouri. Uh, On Wednesday, they found Eskridge dead from a gunshot wound. The uh, individual who shot Eskridge was there on scene, cooperated with law enforcement. Preliminary investigation uh, indicates that Eskridge approached the uh, uh, victim, in this case, with a dangerous object in an aggressive manner. Uh, And that victim, fearing for his life, shot Eskridge in self-defense. Now, the investigation is still ongoing. It will go to the uh, local DA, uh, for review, but uh, again, police are already publicly stating that uh, they believe that this was a case of self-defense. And finally today, our good deed of the day, Oklahoma, Kingfisher County, Oklahoma. News 9 reporting a, a former police officer helping to find a missing man from Texas uh, after he saw the uh, man's abandoned vehicle in uh, rural Kingfisher County. Uh, just happened to be in the right place and at the right time, as a matter of fact. Uh, Richard Staden, former police officer in Kingfisher, Oklahoma. Now he works in the oil patch. He had uh, been out in the oil patch and, and, and saw this abandoned vehicle, called his friends at uh, dispatch to run the tag, and it came back uh, registered to a man out of Fort Worth, Texas, who had been reported missing two days earlier by his family. So uh, Staten and others started searching for the guy, and after about four hours, they found him safe under a tree. The 82-year-old's family, able to bring him home, Kingfisher County Deputy Brad Logan says the family broke down crying, ran to me, gave me a hug, and said, thank you. Man was dehydrated and confused, but is expected to recover, according to deputies, and again, in the right place at the right time, and willing and able to uh, to do the right thing. Richard Staten, there in Kingfisher, Oklahoma, we thank you, sir, for your very good deed. That is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. I want to thank you, as always, for being a part of the program. Don't forget, you can subscribe to Town Hall Media on YouTube, uh, or you can subscribe to Bearing Arms, Cam and Company on Apple Podcasts or the uh, other fine podcast platforms, whatever is your preference. Uh, we will be back on Monday. Again, uh, Culpeper County Sheriff uh, uh, Jenkins, Scott Jenkins, is going to be with us 
Fingers crossed that it's a quiet weekend in Culpeper County, Virginia, and the sheriff doesn't have any other business to attend to. Uh, in the meantime, hope that you have an opportunity to maybe get out to a range this weekend as things are starting to open up around the country. It is going to be a, a beautiful, almost 90-degree day on uh, Saturday and Sunday in uh, Farmville, Virginia. So I've got some yard work to do. Got to you know, make sure the baby goats are doing all right and the bacon seeds are uh, uh, well cared for. But I am hoping to sneak down by the creek which is where my little shooting spot is, and uh, actually get in some range time. It has just it's been cold. It's been kind of miserable, but it is going to be a glorious weekend. So I'm looking forward to getting out and uh, getting some rounds down range. Until we talk again, be safe, be well, be free, and we'll see you here soon with another edition of Bearing Arms, Game & Company.